If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet, we are back. We're dealing with a South African Air Force. We have a fellow here, Captain Jacques de Trois. Now that's how my wife calls him. She speaks in French. Uh, but for us, Urkis, normal people, we talk about Jacques de Trois. Jacques, you are very welcome here. Thank you. You were an electronic warfare officer. You started with your national service. You were a dog handler. That's the first episode. Funny enough, I got a letter from somebody else who was also there at that very same time. And he says he was in a bungalow next to any else. So he probably knows you. But now we're back for episode three. And this is where it's getting interesting because now you're flying. And you're doing all sorts of other things as well. So I'm going to keep quiet. I'm going to hand over to you. And we're just going to, going to listen. Thank you, Chris. Um, so episode three, I can't believe it's... Uh... Uh, we, we got here. So there's still a lot of stories lined up. Um, and in this episode, I'm going to cover the, the period between um, the late 1990 to uh, middle 1994 um, and all, all the things that I did in my uh, career at that time. Um, so at that stage, we were now flying very regularly on both uh, on the, the DC-4. Uh, and the Air Force had an annual... Um, exercise called uh, Golden Eagle, Hover Arendt. And that is to um, practice the Air Force's ability to um, mobilize a squadron and to, um, there's also, there's a very specific plan and a purpose to each one of these exercises every year. Um, and, and as we were developing the doctrines around uh, mobile ground signal intelligence and also our flying uh, capabilities, we started to uh, be more part of the um, Golden Eagle exercises as we went on um, through that time. Um, so the the one uh, Golden Eagle exercise was very interesting because we were um, in the same exercise for the one week uh, part of the uh, Blue Forces and the next week part of the Red Forces. So the Blue Forces, um, we were on the ground. So how it worked is that um, Uppington was the base for Blue Forces. And um, there were some targets there and some radars set up there um, to now track attacking aircraft and try and shoot them down electronically. Um, and the Red Forces were flying fighters from um, Louis Trichardt's now Mercado base, uh, Hoodsprite, uh, Vardekloof, and also from Bloomsprite. So um, three of us, um, there's a, a Brett Pretorius, John Basson and myself, and a communications uh, guy um, deployed about uh, 15 kilometers north of uh, the Bloomsprite Air Force Base on a farm, I think it was Bishop's Glen, on a little uh, ridge line there. And we camouflaged ourselves in there, so uh, we were part of the exercise there. And our job was to try and uh, pick up any communications or any early warning that fighters were taking all from them spread and warn Uppington that they are on their way. Um, and here we, we had the benefit of um, Brett Pretorius. He was the lieutenant and the other two of us were corporals at that time. We had uh, Brett's experience from the border war. Um, he spent a lot of his time listening to communications. He was, he was quite an expert at this and we learned a lot from Brett. But while we were there, Brett came up with a, a set of um, rules of engagement. He said, if we really honestly can uh, show that we uh, electronically, as in using communication intelligence, could detect uh, an attack, we would report it. But even if, they, if, a, if a fighter aircraft flew over our heads and we did not pick it up electronically, we wouldn't report it. So that, that was the, the, the games that, and that's the rules we set for ourselves. So um, during that week, our success rate was over 90%. So 90% of the strikes from Bloomsprite, we could detect before um, they, they got to Uppington. Okay? And, and, and that was with the fight aircraft, the Impalas flying from Bloomsprite, not once using their radios. Um, and how we did it is, um, you know, uh, Air Force base is a system. There's a whole lot of other users of communication on that base. The air traffic controller is there. Uh, the fire uh, brigade is on the base, and every time they move, they give away clues. So the, um, the, the one day specifically was quite a, a funny incident. 
we were sitting there listening to the um, the tower because a lot of these subtle clues to that they were fighters uh, preparing for takeoff came from some of the traffic patterns uh, around Bloomsbrake. So the tower um, that two uh, DC threes in, in uh, on a training sortie doing circuits there uh, at Bloomsbrake. And at one stage, as these two were approaching to uh, for a practice landing, um, the air traffic controller said to them, um, you know, they gave them a call sign, can you please do a rotation to the right? Um, and that is basically, you know, now if you, if you have your um, situational awareness and your map of what is going on in the area and you understand the uh, rules of the flying rules in that area, you would know that he was now diverting them away from the, the runway because something else is happening there. And, um, and, and, and this uh, DC-3 pilot uh, immediately came back and he said, um, affirmative, uh, you know, rotating to the right. Um, and the tower asked him, um, um, what is your endurance? So how much fuel do you have? And the commander of the DC-3 came back and he said, uh, I've got three hour endurance. And the air traffic controller said to him, um, oh, I wish I had a three hour endurance. So uh, um, that, that's how we knew because the two aircraft were diverted away from the runway that something was going on. And that would be a, a giveaway that there's these other planes taking off. Um, the guys who uh, often gave away the game were the fire brigade because every time they had to cross the runway, they had to ask for permission and they would say, oh, you know, we are just behind the Impalas taking off. You know, and they would give away, they would break the security of the Impalas without them even knowing about it. Um, and also, um, when the Impalas go to the end of the runway now to take off, they have bom bombs hanging under the, the wing. And before they're allowed to go onto the runway, there's a Land Rover that goes up with the armorers and they pull the pins from the, the bombs before they go onto the runway to take off. And that's to keep safety um, until the last minute. And the, the, often this, also these guys at the radio, they also have to ask permission to go onto the runway. And the only reason why the, um, the AJ Gary would go onto the runway was when there were fighters going to take off. So, so we, we learned to listen to all the clues around the, the, the fighters and, and, and you know, that's how we, um, we managed to uh, successfully report more than 90% of the flights. Um, and even sometimes uh, fighters would come directly over us and you, know, you couldn't miss them. Um, but we didn't report them if we didn't pick them up electronically. So that was the first week. And the second week now, um, was we were now on the other side, we, we were now part of Red Forces and we had to go and find the radars in Uppington that were operating there with DC-4. So on this specific flight, this was a, um, probably one of the most memorable DC-4 flights of my life. Um, it was um, myself, um, John Basson, he's Mosi Basson's son. Um, he later also became a helicopter pilot. And John, um, I think he also got awarded the Air Force Cross for saving a lot of people in, a flood, in the floods in Mozambique. Um, so John was uh, with me on that flight and also Jan van Weyck. Um, the three of us were in the back of the, the DC-4 were 6906. So um, what we would do is take off from Swartkops and we would go directly south, past, way past Kimberley um, um, to the south. And the idea is to then sneak in low level to Uppington. Um, and then we would pop up to um, uh, 11,000 feet. And, you know, there would be a search radar, radar at Uppington. It would pick us up. And what we would hope for the moment we break the horizon is that all the other radars would then switch on and we would um, analyze them, report them and quickly then plunge down again and um, run away from there as fast as we can. So the first run um, we did very successfully, went up, the search radar picked us up. The moment we broke radar horizon, all the radars came up um, and uh, we could immediately see there were four or five other um, target tracking and missile radars uh, based at Uppington. And, um, but, but we knew that there were more and we didn't get all of them. So we, we ran out again and um, we, we turned around and um, the, the commander of that mission decided, okay, we're going to try another time, a uh, second time. So we sneaked in again, this time a bit closer. And um, as we went up and broke the radar horizon, um, the radars exactly came up again. We've got one or two other ones that we didn't get before. And um, so what you do is now you're a prime target uh, and you need to get away. So, so we have this procedure in the DC-4, which is 
not which is operational flying procedure will be plunged. Now the, the DC-4, they put the flaps out, they put the gear out, and they put the nose, nose down, and you actually fall like a brick out of the air to, to bleed off uh, height as, uh, as soon as possible to get to a low altitude, and then you get out of the radar horizon so you can run away. And we did that, um, and we plunged, and, and this, this almost, you almost have the sensation of negative G in the aircraft where you've got to be really strapped in for a plunge, otherwise you'll end up in the ceiling of the, the DC-4. And we, we, um, the uh, commander um, uh, uh, balanced out the aircraft to the, uh, you know, right there, um, almost uh, just below a thousand foot. And now we were running away, um, you know, low level away from the from Uppington. But on one of the, the channels, um, I started picking up uh, uh, um, a fighter controller directing two fighters on a specific vector. And when I looked at my map, I saw that if you draw a line from Uppington to our position, that was our vector. And I immediately reported that to the flight coordinator. And um, so we, we, we were now in for a surprise because we didn't expect two Impalas to be scrambled now on our position. And we Red Forces, we need to get away. So what followed was a couple of minutes of extremely low flying. Now, if you think of a DC-4, you, you know, you don't think that's a plane that you would normally fly low, but we were flying so low that in the Northern Cape there, we were, had to go up to go over game fences. Okay? The, you know, these uh, six foot game fences, we, we really were doing the going up and down over the game fences. That's how low we were running. I, I think um, Mosi Basson later, when we did the analysis of that story, um, he called it, uh, we were flying in the weeder sphere where the weeds grow. <laughs> So, um, um, the, and the next minute I look, I've got a picture I'll send you where I look out the window, um, you know, to see, and, and I see these two impalas coming down in about a 45 degree dive on our tail and turning into us. And um, so, but if a fighter is in a situation like this, you know, they usually expect fighters and, and, and your engagement time is very short. You can't stay there very long. Now we're running away south, uh, away from Uppington, and these two impalas are on our tail, and I could hear them say, um, going for missiles, and they, um, they had two infrared missiles on them that they would have a lock, and if you have a lock for a certain amount of seconds, then they would claim a kill. Now, we were so low with the DC-4 um, there in the Northern Cape that they, they couldn't get missile locks, so he said, switching to guns. And then he, he tried guns, and, and, and if they could get a, a, a gun camera picture of us, they would, would claim the kill for the exercise. But um, after a few minutes, they, they couldn't even do that. And, and when we analyzed the sortie afterwards, um, one of the, the, the learnings that was pointing out to us by the fighter guys is that um, a fighter, um, its guns doesn't shoot forward. It, it's um, aimed about seven or 11 degrees up. So normally if you fly uh, and you shoot, you fly forward because the bullet, are, you know, um, you're leading the, the target with your bullet. So you can't be straight because they would just drop away. So because we were flying um, on the ground, they couldn't, if they flew behind us, the gun would point above us. So they couldn't get us in the gun camera. So, so we were safe for that. But at that stage during the fight, we didn't realize that. And the only mistake they said we made was um, the commander often did, uh, um, had to go up because it was so low to dip the wing to turn and then go down again. And every time we did that, we, we were now coming into that gun camera range, um, you know, ab above the, the horizon. Um, so that was as quite an exciting um, ride we had in the Northern Cape. And it was quite a memorable um, exercise to do. But you could just imagine uh, that night in a pub, all the stories about the DC-4 got away from the fighters. And, you know, uh, we would never uh, allow the guys to not forget that but that that was really an exciting sortie um but we also um with the dc4 i remember um it had a additional um um so if you come into the front of the dc4 there's usually a, a galley a little kitchen and then um you have the, the main compartment beyond that um Spook didn't have a galley in the front so the the galley was taken up by a harvard petrol tank uh, a fuel tank and that tank was not for extra fuel, it was for extra oil, because the, the DC-4 would carry a lot of fuel, but you needed additional oil for the longer sorties. And that gave us a range of uh, in excess of uh, 12, 13 hours of the DC-4. 
Um, so our longest sortie, I think my last DC4 sortie before um, you know I moved on to the Boeing, was um, a sortie we did um, of two and a half, 12 and a half hours with a double crew. So it was uh, you know quite significant. I don't think a standard DC4 would be able to make that without the additional fuel tank. Um, but in that time, also um, uh, the our course in uh, 1990, the electronic warfare course was course number three and number four did now take place. And there were now enough people to send on um, C, C equi survival equipment orientation um, with the Navy and Simon Star. So one of the things is, um, and I think we briefly spoke in the previous uh, episode about all the, the equipment we had, um, the survival equipment we had on the plane, but um, we all had to be signed out on all the equipment to be able to use it over the sea. And, and for that, the Air Force had a proper um, a sea survival course uh, that, that pilots that usually operate over the sea had to do, but um, uh, we didn't do that. Uh, so um, we did the orientation on the equipment only. So for that, we took the DC-4 down to Acerplot uh, in the Cape. And then um, we spent some time there to now do the, the course on all the equipment. And I think the, the, it was in September and it was extremely cold in the Cape. There was uh, snow on all the mountains um, there in Cape Town. And it was raining this, uh, this day that they took us to the Acerplot swimming pool, the, the base swimming pool. And we were all given a, a May West. And uh, now for the first step, we put on the May West and you had to jump in the swimming pool. Um, and then you have to pull a lever for it to blow up. Now, as we jumped and you pull, nothing happened. It didn't blow up. And we realized that uh, they removed the little canister that would blow up the May West. Um, you know. And the, the idea is now to force you in that sudden shock of the cold water, you had to find a, the a tube that you had to pull out to bl manually blow it up. So you can float. So they don't want to do that when you're in the sea. You need to learn that there. Um, so, so that was um, uh, quite an experience. But the next day now, we were going to Simonstown to the naval base to actually go do that in the sea. So um, the 11 of us um, arrived there and there were two Navy divers with us. And uh, they loaded us on one of the harbor service craft. And we went out to just outside the actual Simonstown harbor um, are a couple of um, submarine mooring points. Um, and near one of these points, they said, okay, um, we have to jump into the water of our May West and pull the handle. Now, you don't know what's going to happen. So luckily, as we hit the water and pulled the May West actually inflated. And now they taught us there were two Navy divers with us there in the water and, and they showed us that you had to now hook in your arms and form a circle. And the moment you do that, in the next few minutes, it's quite amazing. The water in that circle becomes a couple of degrees warmer than the water outside the circle. And immediately you can feel that. It, it makes a difference. So, so every now and then they would get a, one of us to just go out of the circle and you would feel that rush of cold water come in. Um, and you would just know the, the value of just that piece of knowledge. If you ever were in a situation where you had to um, bail out over sea, that, um, that would help you. But anyway, after about... Um, uh, 20 or so minutes, it couldn't have been more than that. They came past again with the um, harbor service craft and they threw a 10 man dinghy um, into the sea, but upside down. And at the bottom of the, the dinghy are uh, strips that, uh, and what they wanted to teach us there is that somebody's got to climb on top of it, hold the strip, and fall backwards, and that will flip the dinghy the right way up. And now all of us could get in. And so one by one, we got into the dinghy, and then you realize that was actually warmer, it felt warmer in the water because you were now wet in the wind, um, you know, the 11 of us in a 10 man dinghy and it was cold, it was really cold. And now we were um, there in the dinghy and also not, not that long, about 20 minutes later, we hear this, uh, the puma coming um, out over the dinghy and it flew over us. And then the divers said to us, okay, now the next step of the exercise is they're gonna start hoisting us one by one into the helicopter and they'll do four at a time and go drop us uh, on the key side in Simonstown and go next four, next four, they'll, they'll, until everyone is out of the dinghy. And, um, but the, the, the trick here was that when you got out of the dinghy, you had to deflate your May West uh, halfway down and then swim backwards. It's a specific way that you paddle backwards to get away from the dinghy so the helicopter, when it comes in over, doesn't flip the dinghy over with the other guys in the water. 
So if you like swim away about 50 meters, the helicopter would come, hoist you, um, and, and that would be the exercise. So first off was uh, John Basson. He was out of the dinghy, swam away, and he got hoisted. And while he was hoisting, I got um, out, and I was second, um, and swam was swimming to, uh, away from the dinghy. Um, and the next mo mo moment, um, the third guy, uh, Philip Grinschloss, I've got a, a, a photo of, of the four of us, the first four of us there that I'll, I'll send to you. Um, but Philip um, was now the third guy out. But while I was being hoisted into the helicopter, the commander of the helicopter decided that the jet pipe temperature indicator was getting a bit hot in the helicopter. He was just going to fly a circuit there in Falls Bay. Uh, now, for those of you who don't know, Falls Bay is where you got those uh, uh, videos of the sharks jumping and breaching out of the water, trying to kill seals. Now, that's where we were in that bay. So, um, anyway, so um, Philip got out and, and, and he didn't realize that oh, he's alone there uh, by himself and we flew away. And he didn't know why we were flying away. But we came back and, and while we were flying away, um, you know, Philip was now 50 meters away from the dinghy. And when he looked back at the dinghy, this black fin came out of the water between him and the dinghy. And Philip absolutely, um, you know, he had panic there in the water. I think any of us that were in that situation at that time, you know, but um, then the Navy divers just said to him, don't worry, it's just a, a seal. You know, was this a seal playing in the water? It was, um, you know, a bit curious about what's going on there. So, um, you know, uh, Philip was very relieved for this. And, and you'll see in the picture, he's smiling quite a lot <laughs> um, once we, um, we got into the, um, the Puma and they, they dropped us off. But um, that was extremely cold. I think for another day or two after that, you know, um, especially my thumbs and the inside of my, my knees were extremely cold that I couldn't get life back in there again. And uh, it took a lot of um, antifreeze to get, to get blood back flowing uh, in your limbs at that time. <laughs> So uh, that was that was great fun. But um, um, just after that, um, you know, your your primary uh, mustering in the air force in electronic warfare is intelligence, uh, um, and I, I think I explained how that worked uh, in one of the previous um, episodes. So um, in uh, August to October ninety one. Um, I got selected for uh, officers course and I went to the officer selection um, and then um, I was a candidate officer for a year, then a second lieutenant for a year before I became a lieutenant uh, after that. But um, just after doing the course now in early um, in July um, 1992, you know, South Africa at that stage was preparing, you know, we had the announcement that Nelson Mandela was going to be released and ANC unbanned. And elections, um, as you know, would happen in the middle of uh, the year in, in 1994. So we were in between those two dates. And there was still a lot of areas where there was a lot of unrest in South Africa. And one of the, 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 the boiling points at that stage was KwaZulu-Natal. Um, and the um, defense force at that stage decided with the police to do an operation in KwaZulu-Natal to try and get as many of the weapons, especially AK-47s, out of the areas, just to stabilize the areas so that um, um, democratic elections could have a, a proper um, chance of succeeding there. So um, I was posted by Air Force headquarters to um, um, a mobile air operations team or a Mayot. Uh, it was called Mayot November, based next to the Oraby um, airfield in Peter Maritzburg. Um, and I was to be the intelligence officer for this operations, mobile operations team, reporting through to the forward uh, air command post, air force command post in Durban. Um, so uh, I was uh, off to Durban uh, and then from Durban to Peter Maritzburg. And they, um, myself, um, uh, two communications guys, one from Durban and one from Pretoria, stayed in the caravan for the six weeks there next to the Oraby um, airfield. Um, and and the, the purpose was, um, we had a briefing before I went um, by uh, one of the police generals and he said, you know, uh, he still put up one of those old uh, transparency OBA projector slides um, in this presentation, in this briefing he, he gave us. He said, um, this graph, and he showed us, show us um, the murders in KwaZulu-Natal since um, um, data was collected, you know, since um, the first data was collected. 
Uh, and this went back to almost 100 years. He, and he said that um, this graph showed that on average, every month in Guzzalina Natal, uh, uh, 487 people were being murdered. Um, and and the, the reasons why are, you know, tribal or family or personal. And only recently, um, politics became a, a polarizing factor in all of this. So this has been ongoing for, for decades where we, uh, all these people were being murdered in Guzzalina Natal. And that's why it was so important with, with all of that happening that we take as many weapons as possible out of prison in Natal at a time. Um, so the air operations team um, had an aloe head and a, um, a puma from Durban. Um, and um, my job was to liaise with the army intelligence and sometimes with the police um, to make sure that I gave the air crews the best possible picture of what was going on in the area they were likely to face. Um, as we were conducting operations there to stabilize um, that area, especially the, the focus area was the Richmond to Gela Ferry area, then President Natal. And that was fascinating because um, for me personally, because I've never operated independently as an intelligence officer. So I had to learn on the fly and, and you get thrown in a bit of the deep end. But by that time in your career, you get used to that. Um, but, um, you know, so. We started putting together um, with the army. The army was the lead on all of these operations, um, uh, specific operations to go into a place where we knew there were weapons and we would take out the, the weapons. Um, and that was anyway the plan. Um, but in that time, I got to know the chopper guys from 15 Squadron in Durban very well and how they operated, their language, their culture. Um, it was um, quite an experience. And, I flew with, uh, with, with the teams wherever they went. I realized that I had to be with them wherever they landed. I interviewed the army or the police guys there to get firsthand um, uh, information on what's going on on the ground. So that night when I came back to Oraby that I could report it back to the forward air command post. Um, so I learned a hell of a lot in a very short space of time about how the, the army and the police operated um, with the air force. The Air Force guys, I remember the, the pilots, um, uh, Joe Stoltz, uh, I used to fly a lot with him in the LO8. Um, one of our first flights, uh, we just took off from Oraby and uh, he took the map and he handed it over his shoulder. He said, um, car work, can you navigate? And then I thought he was joking and he said, no, take the map and navigate. I want you to navigate. But uh, luckily by that stage, um, my map reading was um, uh, you know, very good. So I took the map. And I said, okay, we're here, so we are going. And I showed him the, the trick beacon on the horizon where we should go. And um, within a couple of minutes, he realized, okay, I know what I'm doing. And then from there onwards, we know, if I flew with Joe, um, he, I would be his navigator on, on the helicopter. And I really enjoy that, um, working with the guys like that. Uh, you also learn the language, um, you know, with these chopper pilots. Um, so they refer to uh, LO8 as a draft car or a little wire car because of the frame, it looks just like a wire car. And they also, the code word for uh, a puma was uh, giant. So often you would hear people talk about giant. That was on the radio, precise that you would know they're talking about a puma. Uh, but there was also another term that I learned at that time, and that was ops lemon. Okay. So these guys, this is a term they got from the bush um, war, where if our operation didn't go according to plan, they would call it a lemon, uh, and that's operation lemon. And we turn out to have quite a few of these because often the, um, the intelligence that we worked from, from the army or the police at that stage was even either non-existent, not verified or completely wrong or outdated. And um, so uh, we had a lot of these ops lemons um, to contend with, but that in itself was, was quite a learning curve. So I remember this one specifically, um, um, Joe and, the, and myself and the flight engineer took off uh, just before sunrise but a half an hour before sunrise. And behind us, we had a Puma with two policemen and eight uh, army guys with our force. And um, the, the mission for the day was the police had information about a guy um, that was wanted for murder. He had killed 12 people by then. Uh, and, and they had some information that in the last 24 hours, he was in a hut there in the Tugela Valley uh, on the side of a mountain. So the idea was that because the Puma was much faster than the Alouette, that uh, Joe would be ahead uh, by half an hour. So by the time we got there, the Puma would be two minutes behind us. So we worked out the, the route like that. And as we came down this valley, you know, you look at this valley and you see the hut. Um, 
the, the flight engineer took a yellow smoke grenade and he, he popped it over the, the roof of this hut. And then we spiraled up to now be the, the cover for the Puma coming into land. And it landed next to the hut. The police and army guys were out and, and that was empty. And, um, you know, with the debrief of this, I realized that as we came down that valley, the picture would have told us there was nothing going on because at some of the other huts, you would see smoke as people were starting to uh, now make fires or there'd be chickens around or dogs. There was nothing. There's, this hut was just empty. There was nothing there. So before you even knocked on the door, you would have known that there was nothing going on. And, and that type of um, uh, event would play itself out a couple of times in that six weeks where you got to a place where there's supposed to be weapons and it's nothing. What we did, however, find was a lot of marijuana, dacha. Um, so the, that whole area, that's the cash crop um, of choice. So a lot of people make the income and they're living off marijuana. And we were not even looking for the stuff, but uh, I think in that six weeks, we, um, we confiscated uh, 120 large bags, like in bailing bags of, of marijuana um, that was on its way to Johannesburg. Um, the, the, this one specific sortie um, was uh, army commandant, uh, police captain, and myself in the back of the Alouet. And we were flying down the Tugela River um, in the Tugela Ferry area. Um, and the, the army has set up a new camp. And we were now late afternoon flying back to the camp to uh, go and, um, and stay there for the night. And um, as we were flying down the river, I noticed that uh, there was a black pipe running from the river into a gully uh, on the side of the hill. And um, I said to um, Captain Stills, um, you know, just saw a pipe go up there that looks quite suspicious. Um, so he, he rotated around and, and landed there in the dry riverbed side of the Tugela. And I got out and um, I had my Z88 pistol with me, but, you know, went up the mountain. And I was not even 50 meters away from the river up this gully. Um, under the canopy of a tree when I saw that these guys were planting the marijuana trees under the tree. And this black pipe about the thickness of my thumb was the irrigation pipe that they used to water the trees under the big tree. And as I got to the top of this little um, um, agricultural um, uh, un un you know, business there under the tree, I saw that there was a sorting table. And next to the sorting table, there was a big yellow metal cake tin. And I opened up, and in there must have been about three, four kilograms of marijuana seeds. So I just took that, that tin, it's, um, the rest I just left, and ran back to the helicopter, got in, and we got off. Um, and um, I remember uh, flying back, you, uh, I, I saw under, there was something uh, near a hut, but hidden under a tree. There were two bags there. So Joe hovered next to the side of the hill, and I jumped out, and I went down to the tree, and I pulled out two big bags of marijuana and just took it and threw it in the, the back of the helicopter. Uh, and I remember the one bag was still torn in the back. So the whole day we were flying, the whole floor of the, the Alouette was full of marijuana as we were flying around. Um, but as we were flying now back to this army camp, um, the, uh, all of a sudden there was this shudder in the helicopter. It was starting to shake quite violently. Um, and what had happened is that the Alouette, they put blade tape on the leading edge of the, the, the blade to protect it from damage when you fly in dust uh, and sand. Because it's, it's, um, it's like, a, um, like sandpaper. It actually um, destroys the, the leading edge of the, the rotor. Uh, and they put this um, one millimeter thick transparent tape on the leading edge to protect it. And this has come lo loose, not from the end of it, but from the, the middle section. So it was wrapped around the blade and it was causing a lot of instability. So we, we had a UN emergency landing there in the riverbed. And then we were by that stage about a, a kilometer and a half away from the, the army camp where we were gonna sleep for the night. So the, this uh, army commandant and the police captain said, no way, they're not staying there to fly back. They're gonna walk back. <laughs> so um, we stayed in um, the flight engineer took a couple of minutes to replace the, the blade tape and we were off again. And as we landed in at the army camp, um, these other two came walking around the corner. Um, but um, that was quite an um, uh, interesting experience for me personally. And unfortunately, or fortunately, my career went a different way where I wouldn't do that again. I wouldn't be an uh, intelligence officer again on the uh, mobile air operations like that again. But uh, my career went in a different um, direction at that time. Now, um, 
after the six weeks back at uh, a water club at Jarek. And um, in March 93, uh, I did the Boeing course. This, it was called the Backies course, the Boeing Air Communication Intercept System, the Backies um, system. So I did the course on the Boeing and then started flying on the Boeing. And in the Boeing, we had a, a couple of standard routes. There was obviously the one in the, the internal border of South Africa. That was quite a long one. Um, and then there were a couple of others. The one was to um, on the east coast in the Indian Ocean to Zanzibar, uh, all in international waters. There was one to the Comores, around the Comores and back. And then there was one around Madagascar. We did that one once. Um, there was not much to see in Madagascar anyway. Um, and then the other big one was West Coast, where we went usually from Cape Town all the way up to Cabinda and back. Now, for those long sorties, we used, for the West Coast ones, we used to go to Cape Town and refuel from sea level because you could take more fuel from sea level than from uh, water curve. And you could get a lot of hours in that way. And for the East Coast ones, we used to fly down to Hootsprate in the low felt, also much lower, take more fuel and then um, fly the mission from there. Um, so those were the main sorties. But I'll, I'll tell you a story about one of those memorable um, Boeing sorties a bit later um, in, in, in the timeline where it makes sense to do that. So, um, so that kept on happening. But at that time, um, at Jarek, so, so just to go back to a, a bit of history with um, electronic warfare and the, the signal intelligence unit at Jarek, um, during the Bush War, um, two of our first operators that we had was um, uh, Darby De Beer and Andre Jonas. Now, they, um, at one of the operations here in the late 80s, were deployed with some of the Special Forces guys about 40 kilometers uh, east of, I think, Mavinga. I'm, I, I'm not 100% um, on that, but it, it may have been Mavinga. And the idea was there to prove this concept that they could do early warning from there um, for uh, operations in that area. So they went to uh, Swatko Park, um, the, the headquarters there, Space Forces, and they were issued with all the, the, the Space Forces kits and AK-47s and things, and they were off with these guys. And I think they, um, they were there for a week. I, I don't know how successful that was, but coming back from that, um, now in the, the early 90s, um, a staff requirement was written up to create this um, capability called a mobile ground signaling system. And that would be a formalized system that was um, man portable, um, could be delivered by helicopter anyway, um, and then would form that, that ground-based radar analysis or electronic intelligence capability plus the communication intercept capability. And, and Andre Jonas, um, uh, he was by that stage now a major, he was the project officer for Project David that um, developed the mobile ground signal system. So, so um, at that early 90s, we didn't have the system yet. He was still um, working on it. And um, uh, he had a couple of vendors, um, uh, electronics companies building some of the building blocks of um, the mobile ground seeking system. Um, but of the initial deployments that um, people like Brett uh, um, uh, and myself did to um, the Bush reconnaissance units uh, that uh, were near Fire Freaky and Palaboa, we learned that there was a lot of activity in Mozambique that would be of interest to us, um, but primarily from a training opportunity because it was not much of a military interest there. Um, but also if you get anything interesting there for the, the people who uh, look after that Mozambican deaths and Air Force intelligence, that would be just a bonus on top of that. So um, off the back of that, we decided to have a, uh, a trial deployment to Kumati Put. Um, now, Komati Port, if you remember, is right, it's just below the Kruger National Park um, and uh, just above Swaziland, and it's right on the border with Mozambique. Uh, it's like um, the fence uh, of Komati Port town is the, is the fence, the Mozambican border. Um, and um, so three of us uh, initially went through the uh, um, uh, Franschhoff van Tellingen, Donovan Krokamp, and myself. Um, we drove through with a Land Rover from um, Vardaturf and we, uh, we deployed. So on the actual border itself, the fence that, that's the border itself running north-south, um, every couple of kilometers, there are substations on hills. And these substations are uh, electricity substations that provide the electrical power to the, the, the border fence. 
So it's got three settings, lethal, non-lethal, and off. And for most of the time that we were there, it was either non-lethal or off, um, just because of all the people crossing through uh, and seeking refuge in South Africa at that time. Um, but the first one south of, of the Lebombu um, uh, border post was about a kilometer and a, and a half up a hill um, called Substation 1. Now, there's seven of them as you go down to Swaziland, um, and we were now at Substation 1. And we arrived there late afternoon, um, and we um, we decided we, we're not going to have time to pitch our small ch chopper tents there um, behind the, the guard, guard houses there. Um, right next to the fence, you, you're 10 meters away from the Mozambican border. So we're just going to sleep inside this little substation. Um, there's enough space there just to put up a couple of stretches and sleeping bags, and we'll sleep there for the night. And the next morning, we'll pick a proper spot and, and set ourselves up there for the week. And um, I remember it was about half past six in the evening um, and we were we tuned one of our um, receivers, our communication intelligence receivers, to one of the local radio stations and we were listening to some music there. It was quite a long day driving through to Kamani Port. And um, suddenly Donovan, Donovan Crocup, he jumps up and he takes one of the R5s and he goes outside. And he comes back and he said, no, he, he thought he heard something outside. Um, and he just sat down and all three of us heard it sounded like somebody making popcorn outside. So we took uh, the other R5s and we went outside. And now you're right you know, on the border. It's by the fence. And um, we were, you look down the valley to Rosano Garcia. Rosano Garcia is the town right next to Kumari Put, just the other side of the fence. And the next moment, we see this uh, two bursts of tracer fire coming towards us, but not not to us, I think it was it was shooting at something and it went over the hill and fell and went over the hill to the Kumari Valley um, behind us. Um, and they were obviously shooting at something that was on the southern side of Rosano Garcia on the town itself there. Um, and to this day, I, I don't know if it was a 12.7 or a 14.5 anti-aircraft gun, but it was something quite big um, that, was, uh, that was firing these two bursts. And we realized that obviously there's, there's, there's still a civil war in Mozambique the, uh, go at the moment. And um, uh, Renamo and Frelimo, Frelimo was the government, Renamo was the resistance movement, were still having battles there in that area. So the, the military net we knew would be quite busy there, the communication network. So um, the next couple of days, we, um, um, we just looked at the whole radio spectrum, what was going on there. And we found a lot of what appeared to be uh, military channels, but they were all Portuguese. So we had no clue what we were listening to, but you could hear from the way they speak and the, the coded languages they use that it was military. Um, and we decided to, uh, you know, not waste our time much longer and go back and arrange for, to come back the next, the following week, but with a translator that could help us now interpret what was going on there uh, on this network. Um, so, um, um, the day before we left back to go to Watercliff, um, I think it was a Saturday morning, we drove down that fence again to the, the border post. And as you get closer to the border post, you come closer to Rosano Garcia and just other side of the fence there. And I was driving and Francois and Donovan was in the back of the uh, Land Rover. And um, as we approached the, the, the tarred road to go to Kumari Put, this uh, guy just on the side of the fence just opened up with an AK-47 yeah, next to us. But he was shooting into the air and he just wanted to get a thick to shock us, you know, because he saw where we were in a military vehicle there. Um, and, um, you know, so when he saw it, we stopped and we looked at him. He just waved at us and, you know, put another magazine on the AK. And, you know, and, and it was a bit of a cowboy town, um, you know, as these guys were operating there. Probably a free limo soldier just trying to get some attention or something. But the, we, we could see that there was great potential there for training. So we, we just had to uh, come back with a translator. So the next week, the three of us go first to Palabova to go pick up a, a translator there and drove all the way from Palabova back to Kumari Port. And on our way to Nalspreda, who's just now Mumbela, um, the, the, the uh, um, commandment, the, um, the Land Rover broke down. There was uh, rust in the fuel line and it's starting to clog up the carburetor and we, we just had to get another vehicle that night. So we, we couldn't get to Kumari Port. So we slept in the mess there that night. The next morning, we got a new vehicle. We um, swapped all our equipment over and we were off to Kumari Port. 
And as we, we drove up this hill now back to substation one, um, we could see that the, the South African Defense Force, the two army guards that just stayed in the, the guard post there, was waiting for us outside in the morning there. Um, and as we stopped, they started telling us that, oh, we, we missed a lot of action the previous night. There was a big battle going on there in the town. Um, and um, we just missed it and so on. And um, they had to open, they got uh, ordered to open the gates um, in this electric electrified fence. And uh, about 500 civilians came through the gate and they slept on the South African side at night just to be uh, safe on that side of the fence. And early the next morning, just before we arrived, they now have moved back through the gate and they were down the hill back to their homes in Grisano Garcia. Um, so we immediately set up our equipment and got this translator working. Um, and over the next two hours or so, we formed a picture who are listening to the, the railway network and the army network and, and everything we could find there. And what transpired that night while when we were stuck in um, Nalspray was that at seven o'clock in the evening, there was a train in Rosano Garcia that was leaving um, to change all the guards along the stations all the way to Maputo. Maputo is about 75 kilometers away by train. Um, and this train had about 300 Frelimo soldiers on it. Um, and it was some another 100 or so civilians on the train. And they uh, were leaving at seven o'clock at night. So as the train left, as it pulled out of Rosano Garcia, um, all hell broke loose and the Renamo attacked the train. They, they shot out the lo locomotive with um, uh, three RPGs. And then there were another four guys with LMGs on the northern side of the, the train now that were shooting at the, the coaches itself. And the people on the train got off the train and started to walk back now to Rosano Garcia. But what Frelimo had done is that they planted the row of landmines all around the town to be like an early warning system for them or in case Renamo tried to sneak in there. And some of the, their own people, their own soldiers and their own uh, people stepped on some of these landmines. And when this happened, the guys in the town um, realized that, oh, you know, there's someone coming there that thought it's part of this Renamo, maybe a, a diversion attack. And they threw a couple of mortars that way and they killed a few more of their people there that already stepped on landmines. They killed a few of their own people there. Um, so we got, we, in a space of two hours, built quite a comprehensive picture of this battle. And Renamo then um, left off the battle and went up north. But they disappeared again. Um, and the um, the army captain from the local area that we worked with, um, he had a, a standing meeting on a Thursday with his counterpart in Rosano Garcia. So um, on his way to that meeting, he actually stopped over by us. And we could tell him the whole picture and explain to him exactly what happened before he got there. And obviously the version that they told him in Rosano Garcia was totally different to uh, the story that he was told. But um, he then um, knew all the facts and he could even offer to say, do you have any people that are injured that we can help with? And, you know, um, and sure that he had some superior information of what was going on there. But, but that just reminded us that, you know, um, the, the civil war was well, um, you know, still going on in Mozambique and, and, and they were, we, we could expect the military to be quite active in that southern part of Mozambique. It was also interesting, um, um, the, the actual border fence itself the, uh, was put up by the South Africans. So you had a, a, a high fence and then a razor wire in the middle, a, you know, three, two, one stack like this with electrical lines running through that and another fence. And the two outside fences is just to keep animals from getting into the electrical fence. But on the Mozambican side of the fence, the Mozambicans have every five or seven meters put a landmine or a pomzet that, that got wired to the fence. So if, if anyone tried to get through, they would actually set off these mines. And as you drove on that road there, you could see the landmines and the pomzets right next to you. It's, it's like seven meters away from you. Um, you know, all rusted up, uh, you know, um, they probably, you know, you we're not going to test whether they worked or not, but they were still uh, all active on that fence, um, which was quite interesting. But that was the first two um, command put deployments. And, and, and that showed us that there's a lot of interesting things happening there. And we only had the communication intercept capability at that time. But later, as, the, um, as Andre Jonas was now delivering the mobile ground seeking system to us, um, we now have the ability to also analyze radars. Now, we knew in Maputo, Next to the runway, there was a, a radar yard with a whole lot of Russian radars. 
There was also, I think, a SAN-2 um, system deployed with its Fansong radar, and there was also a SAN-3 um, with the Loblo radar. Uh, th those are the NATO designations for the radars. And we were hoping to, to see more of those. So um, here in um, um, November 93, we had an, uh, uh, the first deployment now with the, um, the full capability of the mobile ground seeking system. And we went back to uh, Kamani Port. But this time, we didn't go back to substation one. We went a couple down uh, further south to substation four, which was uh, about nine kilometers south of Kamani Port, but also in a very high mountain. And I've got a lovely uh, picture that um, uh, I've sent you of um, that, that substation there. It's on a corner where, where there's like an elbow in the in the, the border with Mozambique. And there's a, a beacon there that you can see very clearly. And we deployed there for about a month. Um, and th But this time, um, I took a team of uh, uh, nine guys with me, nine operators, and also uh, um, a translator that was uh, sent to us by Air Force HQ, a Portuguese guy that apparently was very good that they've used before. And this translator was an X32 guy by the name of Mario de Oliveira. Uh, or we, we, we um, knew him as Oli. We, we got to work very closely with Oli. Now, Oli, um, for, you, know, you may not know the story, but Oli, when he was still fighting with 32 Battalion, um, in one of the battles, um, they withdrew from a skirmish to go and set up an LZ for Puma to land with ammunition and food. Um, and as he turned around, um, he got hit in the chest and he immediately went down. And him and three other guys were, as the ammunition and the food came off the Puma, they were put on the Puma as a Casavac and they were flown out um, to a uh, hospital, a field hospital, I think. I, I can't remember if it was Shikati or Nangwa, um, one of those. But um, the when they um, did the x-rays, they found that um, Oli was, had a, a rifle grenade that hit him from under the armpit and was stuck in his chest like this. And they only saw this when they did the x-rays. So yeah, you pull out the x-ray. And there was a, 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 a South African Medical Services uh, major, um, I think it was Niels uh, de Villiers. He later received the Norris Crooks for that operation to remove the, um, to pull out the rifle grenade um, from Ollie's chest. Um, but Ollie was now, you know, alive and well in the 90s working with us. Um, and he was, um, he was awesome to have because he, you know, Portuguese was his first language. He grew up in Angola. And um, him and me worked very closely long hours every day. Just want to get some water. <clears throat> so um, the one day, Ollie and I had to go down to um, the, the local army base there in Kumari Put. Now, it's about um, 25 kilometers south of Kumari Put is a, is, is a, uh, a base called the Makadamia base. There's about a half square kilometer, probably company size base, uh, had a helicopter landing pad, a parade ground and a base, and also had a, a bit of a short runway parallel to the, the road. Um, so Ollie and I had to go past there and uh, I usually go there to refuel um, the vehicles that we used. Um, and while I was refueling, Oli saw some guys um, standing there at the base and he walked over to them and um, he started talking to them. And I could immediately see that he knew these guys because all of a sudden there was, uh, you know, uh, hugs going around and these guys were talking Portuguese to each other and so on. And Oli came back to me with this big smile on his face. And he said, Lieutenant, these guys are all 3-2 Battalion. He says, there's a whole company made up of exclusively old 3-2 Battalion guys they were there to uh, support the, the, the um, patrols around the, the border there with Mozambique. Uh, and these are all his old mates from uh, when he was still in P2. Um, so he was really glad to see him. And they, in fact, invited him that Saturday night to come to a, a bit of a party they were going to have at Makadamia. So um, anyway, so Oli and I um, um, used to work long hours and, and Oli would listen to you know a, a network and immediately tell me, okay, this, this is this type of language that they use, and the, 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 this is the function of this network and so on. 
Now remember um, from our earlier, um, the first Kumari Poet deployments, the call signs we listened to were um, animal names in Portuguese. They would talk about galinha, which is a chicken, or tigre is a tiger. And so all the reporting stations along the line from Maputo all the way up there had animal names. And we could, from that on a map, start plotting where the animal names were at the reporting points. By this time, the network have changed the names now to country names. So, that they're, so instead of chicken, it was now Tanzania, or it was Kenya, or you know Zambia. So the, all the country names were now given to these reporting places. And also, the um, um, when they send messages along the network, um, they did it in um, Russian five-figure code. They had code books um, that had five-figure codes, and they would sing the codes to each other in Portuguese. So it would be like uh, um, uh, uh, numbers um, one to zero, you know, one to three five, to nine to zero in Portuguese, and you would write it down in columns of five, and you would carry on writing it down as you listen to it. And then that we would give to the people who decoded the messages, uh, you know, would break the code and then um, um, tell us, you know, what was happening there. Uh, and it was actually quite a, not a difficult process to do. They explained to us how to do it. But uh, in that time, uh, Oli told us, uh, or he taught us how to count in Portuguese to 20, because if you can do that, you can work out the rest. It's quite intuitive after that. And also there were some exceptions. So if they, instead of, um, singing uh, six in Portuguese, they would say Maya Dozia, which is half a dozen. So if you heard Maya Dozia, you, you know it was six, and then you would write it down. So we actually became quite good without knowing much Portuguese, you know, other than maybe the initial swear words. Um, we, we could easily take down the five figure codes and, and, uh, and we would make up a pack of this, and we would do that just almost for fun to, to, to capture these. But also what we realized that if a message was really um, um, important or very secret, they would use an East German code book, which had mixed figures, that had numbers and letters in the code, which make it, made it a bit more difficult. But that would almost be a priority to decode. Um, and then we would send those through. Um, you know, and, and those would be like a VIP is going to do inspection of all the stations the next week or you know, some general that's coming or whatever, those type of messages. Um, so, um, you know, so it was a great learning experience for all of us. And I made sure that all my nine operators got some time with Ollie so they could learn all of this on the fly as we're going along. So next time you would come there, the, that learning curve would be um, not as steep um, for uh, when, when we operated there. But there was a very interesting um, um, event that happened while we were there. Um, the one day I went to Macadamia again to go and, and refill the, uh, the vehicle. Um, and I went alone this time and it was about midday. And as I pulled into Macadamia into the base, to uh, the, the petrol um, pump there um, near the main gate, um, I saw that the, the place was dead quiet, which was very rare. Um, Macadamia was a very busy place. And on the parade ground, there were about um, you know, five sections uh, or platoons of um, these free two battalion troops um, you know, on the parade ground. And there were two more that, was, uh, that appeared to be support staff, like cooks with their white uniform and, and things like that, in the last two platoons. And they were all there dead quiet. You could hear a pin drop. And I asked the, the, um, the uh, guy there, the pumps, helping me... Uh, you know, what's going on? You know, um, you know, he said, oh, no, um, there, there's a big problem today. These guys from Free2 are going to fire the officer commanding. And I said, what? He says, no, just watch. And, he, and as I was standing there, um, just behind the vehicle, not to be, um, um, you know, too, too nosy about what's going on, I saw this um, captain come out of the main HQ building and he walked to these guys and they had a representative who spoke to him. And basically what, what I learned later is they said to him is that, you know, they were used to being treated with a with lot more respect as soldiers. They were soldiers and they thought that he wasn't giving them um, the respect that they deserve as soldiers. And, um, you know, we're not listening to the, the um, issues and grievances. And, um, you know, he, he was not allowed to command them anymore. So they were firing him. 
So he turned around and he went back into the HQ building and, and subsequent to that, before the sun set that day, he was back in uh, Nels Crater, the commando, and, um, and there was a new major, army major in his place and then things ran a bit better. But it was, it was quite an interesting um, experience to see this happen. You'd probably never see that in your life, that uh, a whole unit, you know, as a one man stand there and they say, you know, um, the, the, this is not right. This is not how you treat uh, people. Um, but it was quite a experience for me to witness that day. And I, I told Oli about it later and he said it, it didn't surprise him at all. These guys were very unhappy for quite some time. Uh, and, 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 you know, obviously with their history, they were used to be uh, treated with a lot more respect by the officers who were commanding them. Um, so, but um, the working with Oli was, um, was, was a great new dimension to our work there and at, at uh, substation four with, uh, and, um, you know, listening to late at night uh, to all these networks as they were reporting. And um, I remember when, um, when Oli had to now go back, we decided to treat him a bit. And I said, Oli, what would you like to, to do for uh, you know, your farewell? And he said, no, he wants prawns. And, um, you know, so we, we knew there was a, a old uh, uh, Muslim um, businessman in town in Kumati Kut. He lived near to the, next to the police station. And he had a business to import prawns from uh, Maputo to South Africa. And in this house across the street, he had just freezers full of prawns. Then he said to us, anytime you want prawns, doesn't matter what time of the night, you just come and knock on his door and he'll sell us prawns. So me and Oli drove through to town and we got um, two two kilogram boxes of prawns. It was back then 65 rand a box. That's nothing. This is like, you know. So um, we, we got some prawns and then Oli had his, uh, he grew up in Namib in, in Angola and um, he said they've got a special way of, of preparing prawns and he showed us that night how they do prawns in Namib and it was just one of those memorable things to stand there right next to the, the uh, Mozambican border, you know, um, like seven meters away from you um, in the middle of the night uh, having a prawn uh, barbecue there with, with Oli, it was, it was quite special. So um, we, we, we really appreciated that. Um, so also the end of um, our work there, the last night, Oli and myself uh, were sitting there. I started to look at different bands of the communication spectrum that we may not have given so much attention before. And here late um, uh, that night, it was just me and Oli left in the, in the tent at that time. Um, I picked up a new network here at the 450 megahertz band, which was the UHF uh, um, radio band and, and it was quite strange because it was firstly Italians talking English and you could hear that it was a military network and, and there was not quite strange and, and Oli and myself listened to this for a while and then we realized that this was the United Nations network in uh, Maputo in, in the southern Mozambican area and we, we really hoped that that would be the start of the end of the, the civil war there and then you know that peace would now come to that, to that area because it was um, really a place that's been devastated by the civil war and it, it was, you know, it, it deserved a new refresh. And, and with the United Nations now there, that would um, help them a lot. So um, um, both Oli and myself left the next day and we had a, a new team arrive to replace us um, for the next month or so there on the, on the hill at substation four. But before we left, Oli said to me, um, and it was quite profound for me at the time, he said to me, Lieutenant, I'll any time go to war with you. And, and, I, and I think what he meant was that he really liked my work ethic of how I treated him and, and my, my team and, um, you know, putting in the long hours with him. And, you know, um, he, he really appreciated that. And, and I think I, I really appreciated that, that, that comment coming from somebody like, uh, like Oli at that time. But um, uh, we're going to tell you about a... a, a, a a memorable trip I had while I was there um, before I left um, substation four that uh, that November. Um, so about halfway through that deployment, um, the radio um, guy we had there came to me and he said, "There's a message from me from Air Force HQ, and I need to urgently uh, prepare to the next day be collected by uh, Cessna caravan from the um, uh, Makadamia base." 
to go to Pretoria, they are short of Boeing operators. So they're, they're, they're sending someone down to come and relieve me. Um, for three days, I urgently need to be on this, this Boeing flight. So they were sending a caravan to come and collect me. So uh, about midday, took one of my guys and we drove down to Makadamia to now go wait for the caravan, but it was only coming like three hours later. And while we were there, um, I had a discussion with one of the army intelligence guys there at Makadamia and he said that um, they've had a report of, a, of an interesting building on the other side of the Mozambican fence, at that corner where uh, Mozambique, Swaziland and South Africa comes together and right in that corner, if you go look on Google, Google Maps, you'll easily see the building I'm talking about. There was a, 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 some communication facility there with a very strange antenna on, on this building. Um, and they would like to know what this was. Do I know anything about antennas? And I said, well, yes, I just happen to know some things about antennas. So let's go have a look. So I said, um, who's driving? And he said, no, no but, um, we can get the helicopter. So there was an LOA at the time there in Macadamia. So uh, we, the guys were sitting there, bored on the tree. So I said, let's go for a flight and go look at this building uh, from the air. So um, we took off and we flew to that, um, it's about 30 k's south of Makadamia. We flew to this, uh, this corner there. It, it's very close to the site. There, there's now a, um, a memorial there for where President Samora Michel crashed. His plane crashed and he, he died there uh, on the South African side of the fence. It's right by that spot where the building is. Um, so we, we flew there with the helicopter and um, we were high enough where I could see into Mozambique. It was just about 100 meters or so on the side of the fence. And what it turned out to be is, um, if I can explain it, it's, it's a concrete building and it had like a, a one of those old drive-in cinema screens made of concrete that was pointing towards the, the north, northeast. Um, and that was a, a tropo scatter antenna. So it, it's a, it was a communication facility built by the Russians. And what it would do is that you transmit your signal against this wall and then it scatters it into the troposphere. Um, and the signal then, then runs in the, in the troposphere and it can jump across the horizon to about 300 kilometers away. If you look at a map, that would be Inamban. So that would be the, the main communication between Inamban and Maputo relayed from there. Um, so um, I immediately knew what this was and then um, so we could go back. So we flew back and we flew over substation four where, where my team was now deployed. And that's when I took that picture that I, that I um, um, sent to you of that deployment um, as we were flying with the LO8 over that site. That's when I took that picture. Anyway, we flew back to Macadamia and we approached Macadamia based from the south. And about 100 meters from the fence of Macadamia, this space, it was a very suspicious um, uh, micro bus, like a taxi bus parked on the tree there. So as we flew over it, we saw it and you said, okay, now the army um, intelligence guy said, Let, let's just have a look what's going on here. So the, the, the pilot took the elevator around and we came through slowly again. And uh, what we found was there was a taxi driver with his female companion, um, doing some horizontal relationship building there um, in the bushes. Um, so very embarrassed, we said, sorry, you know, and then we just flew on and we landed. And a couple of hours later, the caravan landed. Um, I took my little bag with me onto the caravan and at about half past four, flew to um, Swartkops Air Force Base. Um, landing at Swartkops, my wife collected me there. I haven't seen her in a couple of weeks. Um, slept at home that night. That morning, four o'clock, back to uh, Air Force Base Waterkloof on the Boeing and we were off to Cape Town. Um, we landed at um, the military side of, of Cape Town International, which was then DF Milan uh, Airport, because the, the Boeing couldn't land at Ace the Plot. But we stayed at Ace the Plot in the officer's mess. <clears throat> so we stayed over the night. Then early the next morning, we now had to get up from Ace the Plot and go all the way back to Cape Town International, which is the other side of the city. And um, you know, then do our mission from there. But as we left Ace Plot, the, the, the main gate, I think that road um, joins at a T-junction with Kuberg Road in Cape Town in Mulderton. And there was a little cafe there in that building. And, and we used to just like go around the corner and stop. And um, some guys would run into the cafe and just get some chocolate bars or whatever for, for the mission. Um, and it was, we had this one navigator, um, um, uh, Lieutenant Boris Kluter, 
he was from Cape Town, and um, there was uh, the, the main navigator on that story was uh, Major Mark Sonnen. And Mark asked uh, Boris, Boris, please get me a burger. And um, so Boris went and he got a couple of the, the flight crew, a few things from the cafe, came back, jumped in the minibus and we were off again. And Boris started handing, you know, everyone their chocolates or cool rings or whatever they ordered. And Boris would always buy himself a one liter milk. He loved milk. So um, he bought him the milk and then he handed uh, Mark Sonnen his cheeseburger, you know, across. And Mark Sonnen looked at this, he said, what, what does I do with this? I can't read this. You know, I, I wanted the burger, the newspaper, not a hamburger. <laughs> so, so the rest of the sortie, uh, Mark didn't let uh, Boris forget about the stand cheeseburger. You know, he didn't have anything to read on the plane. It was quite a long sortie for Boris. But anyway, we got to um, the Boeing um, startup. Took about an hour. There's, there's all sorts of um, um, navigation um, systems that have to be aligned before we can take off. We took off. And then we flew over the Atlantic, um, all the way up the Namibia coast and all the way to Cabinda. And those sorties were really very um, um, uneventful for the most. There's hardly anything there. You may every now and then pick up a, a ship or, a, you know, you may pick up um, an aircraft or something, but a civilian aircraft, but there's hardly anything happening there. Um, so usually very uneventful. But I think in my life, I did two trips to Cabinda and back. Um, you no, know, we have absolutely nothing going on. Now, I was quite disappointed about Cabinda because I knew there was in Cabinda, there was a SAM 3 system that was very close to the um, oil refinery where um, um, Van and the two and the guys were caught. It was the, the, the SAM 3 was just north of where this oil refinery was. But we never picked it up. I think it was decommissioned by the time we did the sorties there. But anyway, we, we turned around at Cabinda, came back, and when we got to Alexander Bay, which is now the bottom of Namibia's border, we turned inland towards Waterkloof, um, and we landed in Waterkloof, and by this time, I did not feel well at all. Um, so um, my wife uh, picked me up at Waterkloof, and we went home, and I said to her, I don't feel well at all. Um, so she took me to um, the uh, uh, sick bay at one military, uh, the old one military hospital. The sick bay was there at that time. And, um, you know, I was diagnosed with tick bite fever from some ticks got to me and then Kamari quit, which I didn't realize. But anyway, I slept at home that night, the next morning uh, in a vehicle, and I drove back to Kumari Port. So by the time I got to Kumari Port, I was now sick. I, I was taking the medication, but sick. I just walked to my stretcher in the tent. Um, relief, the guy was there to um, um, cover for me for the three days and I just fell asleep and I think I slept for about six hours and, and then I was fine again. But over the next few days, all the other guys on my team got tick bite fever. So, you know, I would walk into the tent and I would see someone, you know, could see the symptoms. Guys were not uh, feeling well and so on. And then um, I said, come in the vehicle, Makadamia, and we would give them the, the tablets for tick bite fever. Um, so all of us in that, uh, that trip got tick bite fever um, on the way back for that. So, but that was quite a memorable trip, you know, uh, doing so much in three days, um, all the way to Cabinda and back to Kumari Port. You know, it was um, quite an interesting trip. Um, so, at the, um, so, so by the time um, I found that United Nations and Edward there before uh, me and Ollie left, um, I wrote everything up, and the next day, um, Jan van Weyck was uh, now relieving me as the, the commander of the mobile ground seeking system then uh, on substation four, and I went back to Waterkloof, and Jan then, did, then uh, took that network and did an amazing job of analyzing it into all its, he actually drew a bit of an organic gram of the whole structure of the United Nations then, Mozambique. And he did a lot of pioneer work around that, that type of communication intelligence analysis for us in, in the team. And we, we could then use that as part of our training going on. So not much interest in the United Nations per se, but you know, just having that opportunity to do that, um, I think was a, was a great, unique opportunity for us. And also um, at that time, we took turns to analyze. Now for the first time, we had the, um, the, the electronic intelligence system with us. And we had a, 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 probably one of the best places that you could see all the radars in Mozambique. So we would, every now and then, the, the Russian bar lock radar would come up, the flat face would come up, 
uh, side net um, was a height finding radar that looked for the height of the planes that would come up. Um, and also, um, they also had a, a, a very old 1970s technology um, spoon rest radar. Um, spoon rest is in the, the lower, um, um, uh, very high frequency band, almost the, the communication band, um, but it worked very well. It worked with valves. It didn't have a transistor uh, array. It, it worked with old valves, Russian technology. And, and interestingly, whenever we flew with either the Boeing or we had these ground deployments, the only radar we ever saw um, was the spoon rest. The spoon rest was the, the radar that never broke down. Um, it was the oldest of all of them, but the most robust of all of them. So um, I, I really liked when, whenever we took off uh, and you would look for the, the spoon rest radar on the communication receivers, not on the elite receivers because of its low band. The radars were much higher in a different band with different equipment. Um, and, and that was a great training experience because every time one of these radars came up, I would get the guys around and get into to take turns to analyze it themselves so they can um, have the experience of having analyzed a new radar, a Russian radar by themselves for the first time. Um, so uh, the commodity turned out to be a great learning experience for us. And in that time, um, back at uh, Jarek at Vodacruf, um, I started to put together the handbook for mobile ground seeking deployments. Right from planning, uh, working out your, your ra radio horizon, we would have courage, uh, logistics plan planning, working with the helicopters, um, all that I started to, to write down. And um, at that time, I became the, the most experienced um, ground mission commander um, in SIGINT. And it was it's very interesting, part of the Air Force culture, and you find it, uh, especially in the flying fraternity as well, it's often the person with the most experience that leads the operation, not or the, the, the aircraft, is the commander aircraft, not the highest rank. Um, and, and often would be in a situation where on later courses, um, some captains and majors would, would now do the, the uh, electronic warfare course. But when we deployed for the first time, they would report to me as a lieutenant. I was lieutenant, they were major, and they would report to me for that, that mission for the training. Uh, and I would then uh, train them up and they would next time take a team on their own um, to go and deploy. Now, at that time, we also did deployments to um, the zeroest area in Nidkadint, then near um, the other side of Gaborone, Botswana. Um, uh, and Botswana at that stage had three uh, American ANTPS 63 radars, awesome radars, and it was great to, to get that experience as well. And every now and then we would um, hear the uh, Chinese uh, F7, the, the Chinese version of the MiG-21, um, would fly from Francistown and we would pick them up. But where we were was just too far south for Francistown to get it all the time. So we later I did a, a, a recce for a, another deployment on a place called um, Bloberg, which was uh, part of the Sokolsberg mountain range. Uh, if you look on the, the western side of the range, there's a gap, a little town called Vivo, and then the mountain continues on the other side, and there's Bloberg. And on that mountain, we had another deployment uh, where they actually could get more communication from Francistown, where the fighters were based. Um, Botswana was quite an interesting one because it was had more of a Western culture. There was a lot more American and British influence there, if I can uh, put it that way. Um, the communication was different. The, the flying was different. The, the call signs were different. There, for instance, every pilot had a call sign. The person had a call sign, not the plane or the mission. Um, so using that, we could easily build up how many pilots and which squadron and what do they fly. We, we could easily do that analysis and build up that picture over time which was um, also quite a good experience, totally different to what we had. We had almost no um, um, Air Force activity from the uh, Mozambican Air Force at that stage. It was, uh, I think we once or twice had um, MI-8s and uh, MI-25s, the gunships fly, but you know that was once in maybe four deployments that we had that. But um, so uh, we also had that experience we were now developing the, the, the handbook for the mobile ground seeking system. And we, we've come a long way with the new uh, um, system that um, Andre Jonas de uh, delivered to the Air Force. Um, and we, we were now in that time in, in South Africa's history where it was now 1994. And uh, we were coming up for the elections. And you know um, that, that was a very interesting time in, in South Africa's history, you know, 
um, no one really knew or could, could um, predict what was going to be the outcome of that. And, and, and I think there were some, um, some very anxious people at that time. Things could, could, could have gone either way anyway. But as, as we know, things happened. We had a successful election. And um, now, just after the election in April uh, 1994, um, we were now going to have the inauguration of uh, President Nelson Mandela. So um, I got invited to a, um, a briefing at Air Force headquarters, which at that stage was still in uh, Church Street in Pretoria. Um, and that uh, briefing was on Thursday, the 5th of May. Um, you know, when they and uh, got into this room and there were about, I would say 40, 50 people in this room. Um, and the, uh, um, the ops commander of the Air Force Command Post was Brigadier Dig Lord. Um, I think this was going to be the last operation that we, he was the operations commander. Um, and, and, you know, at that stage I was a lieutenant standing in the back and I thought, what am I doing here? I'm the only lieutenant between all these people here in the room. Um, anyway, so um, I, I'll, I'll try and um, be as descriptive as possible of what, what happened next. So we, I didn't know why we were there. Um, but anyway, um, uh, Brigadier Lord in, um, announced that because of the impact and the, the importance of this inauguration, um, and the threat to that operation uh, or, or that inauguration uh, from a political point of view and from a security point of view, there was going to be a major Air Force-led um, operation to safeguard the inauguration. And, um, you know, my role there was um, I well, had to um, deploy with one of these mobile signal intelligence teams in support of that operation um, on, you know, in the, that first week, that first two weeks in um, May. Um, so a friend of mine from Jarek, um, he was now a uh, Lieutenant Colonel at it was headquarters, uh, Jean Werther, um, wrote a very comprehensive intelligence appreciation of the threat and the potential response of what we should be doing to make sure that the inauguration stays safe. And, you know, um, I was very impressed by this appreciation because um, uh, Brigadier Lord then asked Jean to present his appreciation. And initially, Jean had way too much detail and, and Brigadier Lord, I read him along, said, okay, give us the highlights here. We, um, we're going to be here forever if, you, if we go through all the detail. But in, in, in short, to summarize what his appreciation showed was that um, through all the sources, uh, and you can just imagine what those sources may, uh, may have been from national intelligence and from the security police and whoever, that there was a real tangible threat uh, at that time from some right-wing organizations to maybe disrupt that um, inauguration when you have these hundreds of thousands of people in the gardens in, uh, in front of the union buildings. You have uh, a representative from each and every country on the globe there at that inauguration. It is the ideal place in history and time to make a big statement. And there were some, some real indicators. Um, uh, Jean didn't go into too much detail about the sources of that, um, but there was a real serious threat to, to that inauguration being disrupted. Um, so the plan was the following. Um, if you can imagine a map of Pretoria, the city itself, with the union building right in the middle, and you've got the, the parallel streets um, you know, running through the city and the, and the union building, if you take a 15 mile by 15 mile square and you put the union buildings in the middle, that was basically the area that, of this inauguration operation. Okay? And the idea was that we would at any given time on the 10th of May during the inauguration, on each one of these four legs of the square, the sides of the square, you would have two impalas armed with um, uh, guns. Okay? Patrolling, so you had eight impalas at any given time on these 15 mile um, legs patrolling. And they would be in that circuit for two hours and then eight others will take over from them. And so we would continuously from that morning to that evening have eight impalas in the air flying aerial combat patrol to make sure that any plane that come into that area that may want to throw things on the crowds 
was intercepted. Um, and about a week before that, what, what um, we were only told um, in that briefing was um, a Cessna from uh, 42 Squadron at SWAT Corps was sent to um, Bloomsprite, where, they, where the fighter pilots there trained with the Cessna to intercept a very slow flying target like the Cessna 105. Um, you know, with, with the Impalas, because they fly much faster. How do you intercept a, a slow, low-flying plane like that? So they practiced for a, a whole week before that operation to do that. And then they deployed to Water Troop, and from Water Troop, they were going to have the 16 plus a couple of reserve Impalas to, to do this, this uh, flying during the whole inauguration. Um, also, there were two giraffe battlefield radars deployed to look for any aircraft that wanted to come in. And, and John's in, intelligence appreciation basically painted the picture that um, on D minus four, so four days before the inauguration, some of these uh, um, right wing guys with, with private planes would deploy to a, a, a field. And at that field, they would prepare the aircraft with whatever improvised explosives or bags of nails or whatever they were going to throw out of the plane. Um, and then when they fly in from either the west or the east from, from Pretoria, they would use the, the parallel long roads, like um, the, the names have all changed now, but uh, it was um, like Pretoria Street and Church Street as navigational aids to guide them to the union buildings and then throw the, um, the explosives, commercial explosives or whatever um, onto the crowds there and just create a, a big statement there on the day. And the idea was to have a, um, a dome around the um, union buildings that would prevent something like that happening. You can just imagine if that had happened, what um, that would have been for South Africa. So um, the, the two radars were deployed. There was some air defense assets also deployed, but um, I wasn't quite sure what they were, whether they were missiles or guns or whatever at certain places to uh, also protect the union buildings. Um, but my mission was to go and deploy in that area and then um, make sure that the electronic spectrum, the radio frequency spectrum was covered. So if anyone used that, we would use that as early warning for an event um, and then report that through the Air Force headquarters. So after the briefing, um, Jean called me aside and um, him and uh, uh, Brigadier Lord had a, a bit of a chat to me on the side. And I said, I need to go and find a place to deploy. Um, and they don't want me to be in that, that square. They want me to be just outside that square, but still we are, would have enough um, electromagnetic coverage to cover that whole area to make sure that if any aircraft flies that in they use the radio that we would pick that up. And then also um, Jean added me um, a white envelope. Um, and he said, guard this piece of paper with your life. And um, yeah. And I said, can I see what's in it? And he said, yeah, open it. And I pulled it out. And in there was a one-page table with all the members of the one of these right-wing organizations and the, the aircraft number, the name of the person and their role uh, or, or position in the, the Air Force of this right-wing organization. And right at the top was the, the, the head of the, this Air Force, this right-wing Air Force. Um, and he said, obviously, that was a very... Um, um, a top secret piece of paper and I need to keep that for myself. I should not even share that with my team, but I should keep that for any reference. If any of these call signs come up, I need to prioritize them for reporting to the command post. And I said, okay, so what do you need? And I said, okay, the team is already uh, packed and ready at um, Watercliff to go, but we, we don't know where to get. So what I need right now is a helicopter. I've got three sites I want to go check. Um, and, and choose the, the best one for this mission. And I said, done. And um, while I was still getting to my car to go to Swartkops Air Force Base, they already uh, tossed the elevator. So by the time I got to Swartkops, the elevator was ready for me, got in with my map, and I showed the pilot the, the, the three areas that I identified on the map um, to go to. We went to the first two, and um, they, they, they were not great areas. They were too close to other transmission lines or interference or repeater stations, and, and they would not have been a great uh, position. But then we flew across that ridge to the north of the Union buildings toward the Arabia Square Dam. And about three quarters of the way there, um, there's an area there called Horn's Neck, 
the way the road like cuts through the, uh, um, the ridge there. And just past Horn's Neck on that hill uh, was my third point that I identified. Great height. Um, you could, you could uh, have great radio reception from there. And I said, okay, this looked like the place. But from my previous experience with deployments, um, my style of doing things is that I would like to get the mission to be there if I'm going to be there for a week. So I asked the pilot to land there. There was like a farmhouse on the northern side of the hill. Uh, and there was a big field uh, open um, next to the house. And I asked the pilot to land there. Um, and I was still in my, my um, light blue office uh, uniform. And I jumped out of the helicopter. And, and as I jumped out, the, the farmer of, um, that lived there came out walking towards me. And I introduced myself to him. And um, I said, uh, you know, with the uh, inauguration coming up, we have a communications team that, that's going to be part of helping the aircraft to just navigate in that area. Uh, and if he would mind if we come and sit there on his farm for, um, you know, until the, the end of the operation. And he immediately said, yes, by all means, very friendly guy, this farmer. Um, and he said, you know, I'll make sure that uh, I, I, I've got some irrigation pipe. I'll, I'll uh, lay some irrigation pipe up there so you guys have fresh water. And I'll put a couple of um, metal bins down there if you've got rubbish and so on. So he'll sort us out from there. Do we, anything we need, we must just ask him. And just before I turned around to get back into the helicopter, he said, I'm very impressed with your intelligence. And I looked at him and said, what do you mean? He says, I'm the only farmer in this area that is not a member of a right-wing organization. Okay? And at that moment, it hit me that um, I didn't even think of that yeah, as, as a potential factor. But by, by some one in a million chance I landed in that area, which was known to be very right-wing orientated. Um, and this guy, you know, he was very happy that we chose him and he was very impressed that we knew that he wasn't one of those guys, you know, um, that would come and sit there. So um, we went back uh, with the helicopter back to SWAT Cops and landed and from the crew room there in SWAT Cops, I phoned my team, I said, get ready. Uh, we're going out the next uh, morning, get uh, rifles from stores and, and ammunition and you're going to deploy on a Friday morning. So we um, went back and so that Friday morning, we deployed, we went out uh, with our vehicles and up this hill and um, we set our, our two tents up there, one for the equipment and one to sleep in. Uh, and that Saturday, um, the Saturday was now the 7th of May, we spent the whole day just going through the, the normal channels and the, the network to understand what is the, the electronic spectrum look like, who is talking there because as part of the inauguration, um, civil aviation declared a, a no-fly zone in that area, so no one could fly in any other um, union buildings anyway, um, just to make sure that, that people didn't come there for joy rides and start looking around there and so on. But um, we spent the day there just getting everyone orientated to where we were and what we were doing there, and I briefed the team up and so on. And we did pick up um, at one stage that one of these right-wing organizations um, had a, a microlight flying club in the area, and they were practicing some maneuvers there to, to the north of the Harabia uh, Square Dam at the time. But, uh, and I reported that through to Air Force headquarters. But um, now I had to, um, on, on the Sunday, the, the 8th of May, was my birthday. Um, but I also had to go back to back home anyway, because the Monday morning, the 9th, very early, we had the final briefing at Air Force Command Post now for this operation. So one of my friends, once again, um, Jan van Beek, uh, who analyzed the United Nations Network then Maputo previously, he came in and he offered to come and relieve me for um, that Saturday and Sunday so that I could um, go home and spend some time with my family um, that day and, and then be on time for the briefing on the Monday morning. Um, so also what happened while I was away that, that Saturday night, or early Sunday morning, somebody tried to sneak into the tent where the guys were sleeping to steal some of the R5 rifles. But luckily, luckily, Jan woke up and he had his pistol with him and he confronted this person who was just happened to be one of these right-wing guys. And he just scattered in the night and they didn't see him again. But um, then I realized that we needed a bit of a protection element there also just to um, look after our safety while we had this important role to, to play there. So uh, that was arranged. Um, and the Monday morning briefing, I asked for um, a, a team of guys just to come out and... and come and look after, help us with security there. And they send a couple of guys, uh, eight guys out with a, with a, um, a biffle and 
you know, they set himself up there and they, they were there for the couple of days with us, um, you know, guarding the place at night and make sure that my guys could get proper sleep and night. So um, <clears throat> finally, on the, the D-Day was now, uh, sorry, so what happened was, um, so the inauguration was going to happen on the 10th, the Tuesday, the 10th of May. But um, when we deployed on the 6th of May, um, that was now D minus four. And while we were sitting up there, uh, I remember John's appreciation said that he suspect that his appreciation shows that uh, on D minus four, the, the guy who would, if they were going to do something, would do it, they would move the aircraft from where they normally were to a, a, a closer airfield where they would be able to operate from and prepare the aircraft then for an attack. And with that in the back of my mind, that, that um, afternoon, um, I sat there, um, I think that was the, uh, the Friday evening, the, the 6th of May. I sat there, um, you know, with... Uh, the, the comms van was behind me and I was sitting on the stairs of the comms van and my guys were here in front of me with all the communication um, um, radios. We, we, we were listening to the aviation band and, and, and listening to everything that came up. Um, and the operator, I can't remember who it was, sitting right in front of me, um, I asked him to unplug his headset so I could listen to the, the actual um, channel myself as well with him there. And this was the general flying frequency for Pretoria that he was listening to. Um, and um, the next moment, this call sign comes up uh, and this guy says he's flying from this place to this place um, and his expected flying time is so many minutes and so on and so on. Um, and at the end, he says he's call sign again. And I asked the operator, I said, did you write down that call sign? He says, yes. Does he confirm it? And he, write, he reads it back to me. And I take my little white envelope and I pull it out. And right at the top of the list, the, the guy who's in charge of these, um, this, this right-wing Air Force, that's his call sign right at the top of the list. Okay? So we already at that stage had communications back to Air Force headquarters. Um, and there was uh, one of my colleagues from um, the electronic warfare team was a, a, a Major Carl Beckers. He was in the command post with Brigadier Lord. And he was the, the, the contact point for me back into the uh, Air Force Command Post, into the intelligence um, office there. So I, I got into the radio myself and I spoke to, to Carl and I said to him, refer to this list, um, top line, line number one, this call sign, confirm uh, this is the message, taking off at this time from this, this airfield, going to that airfield, flying time, I think it was 45 minutes from this A to B. Um, and uh, I said, confirm message. And he read it back to me and he said, leave it to me. I've got it in hand. And, and that's it. We, we left it there. Yeah? And for the, the next few days and the inauguration itself, you know, we were now li listening for anything other than what we would expect to come up. And as they come up, and there were about four or five dozen of, of interesting things, but nothing really, um, uh, we reported all of it as they come up, but nothing really, it, it would appear to be a threat at the time. So late in the afternoon after the inauguration, um, this was now probably about half past five, um, the uh, comms guy called me to the, um, the radio and he said that um, uh, Brigadier Lord wanted to speak to me. So came over the radio and he said, uh, and I'll never forget this, this was, I later learned this was the standard uh, Brigadier Dick Lord um, thing that he did came out of the radio and he said, this is the voice of the Lord. <laughs> and he started laughing. Um, and um, he said, um, thank you very much for um, all your, your guys and what they did here today. We made history here today. Everything went well. Um, please pack up and bring your team home um, and we'll have a debrief next week. But thank you very much for me. This is now the end of the, uh, the operation. Yeah. And great, and we packed up and, and everyone was glad to now be going home. And it was um, still a very strange time and, and, and no one really knew what was happening in South Africa, but um, we all went home and, and that, was, that was history. You know, that, that was history being made right there and then. And I thought that was the end of the story. Okay? But, and now the second part of the story, 
I could never verify. So I would want to caveat that up front. I, I could never independently verify the second bit. Okay. So as you go through your Air Force intelligence career, you do these um, first the A-level, then B-level, then C-level intelligence course. Now that stage, I was due now the end of 94 to go do my C-level intelligence course in the Air Force at um, Air Force College in, in Fort Krakowata, now Tabatani. Um, and um, on this course, the focus of the C level is now your, um, your lieutenant captain level um, in intelligence. Um, and the focus of the course is on collection. So all the different collection channels that you have available to you as an intelligence officer. So um, electronic warfare, signal intelligence, um, you got uh, imagery intelligence, and you got the, the you know, national intelligence, the police, everyone. So all those channels, we had guest speakers and who came and um, told us about what they do and how they do it. And we had a visit to national intelligence and um, very interesting, fascinating, all these, these different channels. Now, obviously, I was by that time quite the expert in signal intelligence. So I actually presented that part of the course, which was quite interesting. But um, one of the, the, the guest speakers who came to speak to us there at, Air Force, uh, at the Air Force College was a guy from the security police. Now, I think um, his surname was something like a Captain Pashtar or someone, you know, blonde hair, um, and him and his, uh, he was captain, he had a lieutenant, they arrived there in this golf GDI, all tires screaming, and, you know, you could just see the picture. Um, and um, he came into the classroom there, and, uh, you know, um, he had this, this very interesting approach, um, you know, looking at the back of this. What he did is, as we sat there in the classroom, there was about uh, 12 of us in this, on this course. He would go to everyone one by one and he would, he would look at you and he'd say, ah, oh, you are um, Captain so-and-so, your uh, husband's name is this and you went to school here, you got so many traffic fines outstanding um, and he would, he would try and get to almost um, show you that he's got a level of information about you that that, that you wouldn't expect someone to have about you. Yeah. So every person on the course, he went through this list, you know, uh, the, the, you, know you did this day and you had this day and, you know, and he would talk about stuff that all of us normally wouldn't know about each other. He would say, you know, stuff that, that um, they would find on people. And I think that was his message is that that's how they operated at that time. But by the time he got to me, um, I was like speaking, oh, yeah, traffic fines, speeding fines, stuff like that to come up. But as he got to me, the only thing he said to me, ah, oh, um, Lieutenant Natoy, you are the guy who helped us stop those guys on the 10th of May. Full stop. And he moved on to the next person. And afterwards, I thought, what the hell was he referring to? You know? Um, and, and, you know, I put two and two together and, and um, what I thought he meant was that, you know, he knew of my role at, uh, on the day and, and, and that we were part of the reporting to the command post and so on and so on. But I could never independently confirm that there was an event beyond that because what would have happened with me reporting through to call, they had uh, obviously um, security police guys in the operations center and they would have sent their guys out to that forward field and they would have just gone and knocked on the door, hey, you know, do you guys want a bribe or something? Um, and just confronted those guys without anything having to happen there. That's probably what, what happened. But um, I spoke to Jean afterwards, um, you know, um, and I asked him, so do you know of anything that happened on the 10th of May? And he said he would normally wouldn't expect those guys to report back to them through that channel with that type of information. But he will ask a few people around and so on. But by the next time I got to see him, he's, um, 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 you know, he didn't have an answer for me yet and he was still looking into it. And, and subsequently, a couple of years ago, he passed away. He was um, on a hunting trip and he had a heart attack and he passed away. So I never could confirm that. Um, and nowhere, anywhere in the records do I know of anything that happened on that day uh, at this forward field where these right wing guys had their planes with the security police. And I don't think I'll ever find out but it left me with this great mystery. What if, you know, the history of South Africa could have been very different or, um, you know, if something had happened. But um, if you 
if you ask me what I think, I think that nothing happened. And this guy was just trying to make a point that he knew that I was there on the day of the inauguration. But that was really a, a, you know, a, a fascinating story that created a bit of a personal mystery for me for years after that, that I tried to resolve and never could get an answer from. But um, you know, I, I, I hope you found that of interest, um, you know, and the type of things that you would expect on the channel. So, um, you know, I think that's me for episode three. Oh, Doc, you know what? Fascinating, really fascinating. And, and as luck would have it, we have a lot of people watching here. So I'm making an appeal. If somebody knows what happened on the 10th of May, 1994, Please come and tell us, because I think this is also now going to linger in my head until the day I die. So I really need to find out. But I have a couple of questions for you. But before I say that, let me tell you, 94, there might be people here who don't remember 94 and the run up to, to Mr. Mandela. It was really an interesting time in South Africa because there were a lot of anger. We were a lot of far right wing type of people. We were left wing guys as well, and they were gunning for each other. The entire world came to South Africa for that uh, Mandela's inauguration. The entire world. There would have been every head of state which you can imagine. So if something happened there, if somebody just, even if he didn't succeed, it would have been blown out of proportion. I never knew about the Air Force work being done in the background. I wish to thank everybody who was involved. I myself was recalled to the police for a camp. When they extended the damn camp for another month, I said two months, back in the police. I was a law student at that stage. I wasn't happy to be back in the police. I could see the deterioration. For me, we came out of this, you know, where everybody was parat, and suddenly I was with these people. I was thinking to myself, is this going to end badly? But I wasn't close to Pretoria, I want to say that too. It was, magnif it was a magnificent time in South Africa, there were hope. Uh, despite all what I've said now, up to about 98, there were a lot of hope in South Africa. The economy was, uh, was going up and uh, it's sad now it, well, it turned out, but we don't do politics on this show, so I'm not going to go further with it. I have to take you back to this book. You said to me at one at some stage they would go into this negative G dive. Now that must be a most dreadful feeling. Were you actually warned? Okay, guys, hold on, take a breath, or whatever, or they just suddenly plunged. <clears throat> we were um, we had a standard procedure where um, the um, mission commander would come on the um, intercom and say plunge, plunge, plunge. That was the, the command that we all knew. And then you would immediately you just make sure that you are strapped in uh, so you don't bounce around uh, too much in the plane. Um, so th that story I told was during a Golden Eagle. We, we only did that one other time uh, during my flying time with the DC-4. Um, we had a specific target, um, a tasking for, um, you know, uh, uh, over the sea, somewhere where it was highly improbable that it would have been fighting aircraft, but it was not impossible. Okay. But um, we were flying uh, in the next moment on the radar warning receiver. We had uh, this um, very high frequency, nine gigahertz signal from right on our tail. And um, when you do that, you don't ask questions and wonder why, you just plunge. And um, you know, we immediately plunged down to sea level. Um, we, we flew low level, did a war circuit back on the same route. And then we, we came up again, um, and then that signal was gone. Um, so that that nine gigahertz band is exactly where you would expect a, a, a MIGS radar to be. But there's, there's also the band where um, some shipping radars uh, are. So, so a ship has got two radars. It's got a, a three gig when it's an open sea, and a nine gig when it's close to an harbor. It gets more frequent updates. And what we suspected at that stage, uh, flying over the sea, was it was one of these ships that just was testing or playing around with the um, 90 gears radar. And that gave us the same search pattern as the, a mixed radar at that time. But that, that was the only time we did that. And, and um, it was, was quite interesting in a, a plane designed for commercial reasons to now do operational flying like this. 
Um, it didn't happen that often. And so only, only once in my DC4 flying career did we do that operationally. Um, and you, every time you, you wonder what the hell is going on here now, and um, you, know, you just strap in and make sure that, uh, that everyone is safe in there. But, but you get trained to do that. Yeah. Everyone is well prepared for that. It never comes as a surprise. Um, I remember um, during the border war, there was one DC-4 mission. It was way before my time, even when I was at school, where I think it was um, uh, Francois von Teilingen and, and Brett Pretorius. They were the two operators on a flight um, where they were potentially intercepted by a Zambian MiG. Uh, and they also did a plunge and so on, but they, they got away out of the area and the MiG turned around and they followed this MiG on the radio all the way back to when it landed. And, and when it landed, it, it ran off the end of the runway and had a crash. So the, the MiG was actually damaged after that. But um, that's the only operational time I know of where the DC-4 uh, did a plunge. Um, and you know, we did the, the one over the sea, and then uh, this was the first time now that I had it was in, on that Golden Eagle exercise. You did say to me by range of his DC-4 was work, and it's just a, uh, 13 hours. Now, I might ask you a stupid question here, but there's a lot of people who don't know what we're talking about. Can this thing be refueled in the air? No, no, definitely not. So, um, the, the DC-4 um, had quite a range, had quite a, a big internal capacity. And like I said, the, the limiting factor for us was oil. So we had that extra harbored um, aircraft tank in the front with the extra oil. Um, the Boeing in which we flew could refuel fighters. So, so Boeing, the, the 60 squadron um, um, was a multi-role squadron. So we did the electronic warfare, some transport, plus the, the uh, air-to-air refueling for the Cheetahs and the, the Mirages. So we would often um, fly and then um, <clears throat> have to go off task. And we sit by the window and watch the, the, the F1s or the Cheetahs plug in and get refueled right here, like, like 10 meters away from you. Um, it, it, that was quite awesome to witness that. Um, but the, uh, the DC-4 uh, did not have that capability to be refueled. In the when you were doing that seaborne rescue stuff, you know, where you get dumped into the seawater, would that be done with what clothes on? What like your normal flight suit, boots? Yeah. Um, so the the general rule was whenever you flew over the sea, you wore your orange flying suits, and um, we we call them orange bags, like the bags you buy oranges in at the supermarket, um, uh, um, lemon suckies. Um, so the the idea was that if you ever um, were lost at sea, that it would be easy to see your orange overall um, in the sea in the water. But for the most, when we flew over land, it was the green, olive green flying overalls. Um, it was a special material called Novix um, that was fireproof. Now, the, the Formula One racing car drivers, they wear Novus, uh, Novix overalls, but four layers. So it, if there's a fire on the car, that, they don't burn. So it's the same, exactly the same material. The, the flight suit is just a single layer of that. And also our boots, um, the flying boots, we were not allowed to polish it which um, you know, some of us found quite strange because um, it, if it had polish on it and you had a fire, the polish would actually be a, you know, um, a source of uh, fuel for that fire. So we were never allowed to polish that. If your boots started looking a bit scruffy, you could just go back to the stores and get new flying boots rather than trying to protect them with, uh, with wax. Now, in the last episodes, we were joking about the Ray-Bans, which these pilots are wearing. But we made a few jokes about the fighter pilots and uh, all forgiven, all in a good spirit. But I now must ask you about this flight suit because I've been told this thing's got a lot of pockets and zippers and things. Is that true? Yes, um, it, it had quite a lot of um, little pockets and things to put things in. Um, you know, at, on your leg, it had a, a, a pad where you could put a map. And especially if, if you're a fighter pilot, you would put like a, a knee map here. So you don't have to look down and look for a map. It would be there on your knee. And also then if you had to do eject and do escape and evasion, you would have a map with you anyway. Um, and the rest of the, the pockets were there for um, like a small emergency kit. We had a, um, a, a, a flashing beacon that you would carry with you. Um, a small first aid kit. Um, we also had a, a knife, um, a special knife that went on the side of the flying overall um, with a, a curved blade that was sharpened only on the inside of the blade. And that was, if you ever oversee any in a dinghy, 
and you have to cut something that you don't have something sharp that can damage the dinghy and then um, you would drown there in the sea. So uh, you could still cut something with it or cut rope or if you, your parachute got stuck, you could cut it, but without a sharp point where you could damage anything else. And so, um, and that was part of the standard kit that we were issued. And every time you flew, you checked your kits and, and you had your headset with you um, and your May West uh, with you. Uh, and we also had a, a special Seiko watch um, that was standard issue in the Air Force. But that was more or less your standard uh, issue kit that you flew with. Also, you had a, um, and we didn't wear this uh, very often, that um, you had like a, a light yellow colored, a butter colored um, set of long john uh, underwear for when it was really cold, but we hardly ever used, um, used to wear that. Uh, and also wool socks, because um, synthetic shock, socks, you don't want to wear that if there's a fire ever. So, um, you know, it was um, all the special equipment that we were issued with to fly with. Yeah, you know what? Now when you talk about the socks, it reminds me I flew with an Air Force fellow once in a Kudu or Bosbok or something like that. So me being a police sergeant, I was actually sitting in the front and he's here on the left. Now I don't know if he's reserve or what the hell he was, but he was a funny fellow. Um, he was really, really uh, worried about his fuel. He would really, he would smell that fuel. He would, he would walk around that aircraft, do his flight checks, and you better not talk to him. He gets very, very obnoxious if you talk to him loathsome, actually. And then he put these stupid gloves of his on with really nice looking gloves. He's got now this um, flight suit and green, as you say, with his wings, ray bands. When you can see this guy is a real Air Force pilot. And uh, so I asked him in my innocence, I said, now, sir, why are you wearing these gloves? He said, well, I don't really know how to fly this thing, and I get nervous when I'm up in the heights, you know, and, and I thought to myself, well, I'm going to die. And then so we were flying around, and you know, he's grinning at me. I mean, he's laughing more at me when he was looking in front of him, because I must have looked very nervous. So he says to me, no, no, it's, it's just, you know, if my hands sweat or something, and he kept on with that stupid story of his. And just after we touched down, he says, no, you know what, if there's actually a fire, it breaks out, it can protect my hands so that I can still fly so that you can dump. And then I realized that these Air Force people or, or something else, they have a different kind of way of looking at life. And it's, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with it. We spoke about radio security, where you were telling us about intersecting and being able just from your intercepts build up a complete picture. I think you call it SIGINT, signal intelligence which shows to me how important this is, how, how really, really important it is. I remember in my time in the police, I was actually concerned about radio security. I used to make a lot of noises about it because they never changed the frequency, as far as I know. And they were quite open how they spoke in Afrikaans, and I knew there were people on the other side who could speak Afrikaans. So for you now, just to, to have to confirm what I was thinking, because if we had this capability, I'm quite sure the enemy and even today we'll have a lot more capabilities like that. Do you think these reports of yours had any influence on the way which the army and the rest then operated? Do you think that they could then just become aware again of how important radio security really is? Chris, that's a very important point and, and something that is um, very important. If people really knew uh, what the capabilities were, um, you know, of, of anyone, whether they civilian or military, to be able to listen into them. I think it will completely um, change the way that they operate uh, on a radio network. You know, um, some parts of the Defence Force have uh, hopper radios with all sorts of countermeasures that you can uh, have a secure conversation or, or data transfer protocols that, um, that are more secure. Um, you know, but ultimately those are also vulnerable in some, if it's important enough, you know, they'll find a way to, to break it. But yeah, it comes down to um, that one of the principles of uh, warfare is security and communication security, especially. Um, and, and that um, to me means that you need to train people from the start to make sure they understand what the implications are when they press that mic button because they are giving information away the moment they do that. So you don't just talk on the radio, um, you know, um, 
you you think carefully what you want to say, where you're going to say, who might be listening. You know, uh, you can give away a lot of information, um, you know, inadvertently just by not having proper communication security in place. So a good operation plan always need to have a, a, a good security, a communication security plan as well to make sure that um, that people follow that discipline and uh, not give away too much on the networks. You know, um, often you would listen to uh, conversations and you can't believe what people are saying to each other on radios, you know, even our, uh, sometimes on our own side, you know. And you need to realize that these um, uh, receivers the, are now commercially available. You can buy them on the internet and, you know, you can listen to things and, um, you know, um, you can listen to just about any open uh, aviation channel, for instance. Um, and you can uh, say, so don't assume that uh, it's only you on that channel, that other people are not talking. People can listen to anything you say. And that even the technology back 30 years ago in the Air Force in, in the 1990s was we had such sophisticated um, receiver equipment that if you were to talk somewhere on that radio, we would Im the moment you touch that, that microphone, it will be recording. And we could listen to uh, a, a, a communication message at that time. Um, so, uh, you know, as part of operation security, it's so important for any commander to make sure that these plans also include that. Um, and that's from first-hand experience. Uh, you know, it, it's absolutely vital um, that you make sure that you um, that you do not, you know, compromise yourself by doing something stupid on the radio. I have to go back now again when you were working with the police and the helicopters. How on earth did you guys know where to find the weapons, the caches and, and in KwaZulu Natal? That was also a very good question. And um, th there were two primary ways. The one was often, um, especially the police would know where a known criminal was, and they would know that that, that criminal would have uh, weapons with him normally. Um, so you would associate that criminal would never leave that weapon, or you know. So uh, where they had information of the location of the individual, you could expect a weapon there. That's how we know that. But on the army side, they were a bit more creative. So um, how do you, if you look at KwaZulu Natal in the Valley of the Thousand Hills and the Tugela Ferry area, the, the geographical area to cover is so vast, and, and you know the the normal communication systems just does does not exist there. So what they used to do is um, two of the army intelligence guys um, that that are from that area, they would normally um, leave their hair a bit longer so they don't look like they're in the defense force, and um, then they would be sent into a specific area that 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 they were now targeting to go find weapons uh, as guys who are offering to sell ammunition. Okay. So they would say, oh, we've got a handful of AK rounds, anyone interested? Because there were a lot of AKs around that obviously came through channels like Mozambique uh, after the Civil War. Um, but ammunition was a bit more difficult to find. Um, so if somebody came around and said, oh, I had 20 AK rounds, who is interested? The, the guys who had their rifles and the weapons would contact you, uh, you know, and say, oh, you know, I'm interested to buy some ammunition from you. Um, and um, so they would walk around with a couple of nine mil rounds and a couple of shotgun rounds, but also then a handful of AK rounds. And, and only people with AKs are interested in AK rounds. And so when they, they get off a taxi somewhere and they start asking around, soon the, the whole um, you know, neighborhood knows that you know, if anyone wants AK rounds, go speak to those two guys. And then they would that afternoon leave with three or four very good leads of individuals and more or less where they were. Um, and then that would form the uh, part of the intelligence picture of where to go and look for these guys with the weapons. Yeah, that's very clever. And I think in one of the episodes, it might be about a week after this one is out. Uncle Boris, the Special Forces General Commander, tells us about operations which the reconnaissance commander guys did during this time where they were helping the police, but I don't want to spoil that episode for you. You have to look at it yourself. But now I've got a last question for you. It is often so in war that intelligence are not used. Uh, the Brits will talk a lot about the code-breaking efforts during World War II. As far as I'm concerned, it's rubbish because everybody else was reading everybody else's codes. We all broke. 
And the best intelligence in the world is not going to help you unless, of course, you can use that on a tactical level. Now, Winston Churchill, let me roll my eyes, is not my favorite politician at all. If you read the books of George M. James, you will find out why, because the guy's exposed there for the lies and the things which, which of course, you won't read in your standard four history books. For instance, it is well known that whenever the German bombers approach London, Churchill would make sure that he's not in London. He would run. He went all the way back to his other residence out in the plot along in the rural area. And I can prove this, of course, otherwise I won't say it. And there's nothing wrong, by the way, what he did. I think as a leader, he had the duty to protect himself. But that is one way how you can use intelligence to save your own ass. As an intelligence officer, very experienced, especially on SIGINT, you were now like the Air Force leading guy on this. Have you ever felt this is a waste of time? That, that, that whatever you're doing is not being impl implemented at ground level. It's just disappearing into the void, you know, all your reports. Quiz, a very good question. Um, you know, a modern um, fighting force um, is a very integrated force that, that relies on a lot of technology and this approach. I think we spoke about it before, of this... Uh, command, control, communication, computers, intelligence, uh, all combining to one, to, and those things, if they work together, they become a force multiplier. So you, you can be um, much more effective as a, as a military force um, in your operations. Now, that implies that you do have a, um, uh, a very well-developed intelligence machine behind it. Um, and that means that you got to rely on everyone's role in that machine. So, so sometimes information flies one way only. And, and you, you wouldn't normally expect to get feedback on what happened with that intelligence. Um, but up the chain somewhere, someone is using a part of the intelligence processes to, to collate that, that information with other information and, co and confirm it and, or, or uh, discard it. I think that's, that's a, a great fundamental in any intelligence process as to make sure that you validate your intelligence and make sure that you know it's real intelligence and not just uh, somebody else's deception plan that you're looking at. Um, so you just reminded me, um, when I did that C-level intelligence course, they showed us a, a black and white movie. Now, if you want to pull this one out, it's being remade right now. Um, it, I, I, I think I've seen a trailer recently for it. It's called Operation Mincemeat. So if you haven't heard about this movie, please go look on uh, the trailer for this on YouTube or somewhere. Um, but Operation Mincemeat is a remake of this movie that was made in the 50s. Um, and this, um, the, the plot of this movie is about the auxiliary Navy of the, um, the Royal Navy who get tasked, the intelligence division get tasked to come up with a deception plan to convince Hitler that the D-Day invasions are going to happen in Greece. Uh, it's a fascinating movie. Now, when I did the, the sea level intelligence course in 1994, um, they showed us the black and white version of this movie. And the purpose of this was that we would use everything we've learned about intelligence and the intelligence process and this whole process of analyzing uh, information to become intelligence. And you know, to, um, how do you uh, put that through intelligence appreciation process? And how do you then formulate your, your uh, collection sources? How do you uh, mobilize them to go and confirm we may have gaps and so on. And we use that movie uh, as a training aid to as intelligence officers to, to um, learn how you actually do that. And, and if that movie comes up, please have a look at that. It's a fascinating movie. And it's based on a real, a real uh, story that happened in uh, the Second World War. Um, but you, part of this process of intelligence is that um, different people at different levels do different analysis and where they've got access to different channels. So one of the worst mistakes you can make in intelligence is to use a single source as the truth. Um, there may be some rare exceptions where you've got to rely on that, but generally you want to confirm, um, you know, if you have a piece of intelligence, you want to confirm it with uh, uh, the human int or a spy, uh, you want to confirm it with your electronic side, you want to confirm it with imagery, 
you want to um, really draw on all your, uh, um, your intelligence um, to confirm something to form that picture. Um, and that analysis that happened, you know, you're turning data to information, to intelligence, to knowledge, actionable knowledge is happening at different stages of the intelligence process. Um, and so people at uh, different levels may have a different view of it, or, you know, you only look at, um, you know, there's an old story of somebody who was looking at an elephant's leg, but they could only see the leg and I don't want to see the tail, but no one sees the whole elephant. And, and the, the risk is there that you, if you see only the tusks that you, you, you think this is a dragon, you know, and uh, you don't see it as an elephant. Um, so you you got to um, firstly have a great training to understand how does your whole intelligence system fit together and who has got which responsibility in that intelligence system and also the governance around that system to make sure that you don't have any failures, intelligence failures along the way. And, and they, that's a continuous cycle of improvement and learning to make sure that um, everyone knows the the role and responsibility and they get the right um, output at the end of the day from that intelligence system. Yeah, that operation mincemeat is, is, is well known. I think with George and James Fellow discusses it in several of his books in great detail. There is a bit of controversy whether it worked or not. Some people say it did, some say it didn't, but I don't want to spoil it to you. Back in the Vietnam War, the US carriers, before they would launch strikes on North Vietnam, or even South Vietnam, in, in support of US troops, they would chatter away on their radios. They would chatter away so much that the North Vietnamese absolutely knew that the strike was coming. And then they would ambush them. Nothing has changed. Whenever the US Navy or any other Navy, and I'm talking NATO now, launches an aircraft, the entire world knows about it. You've got zero radio discipline. Listen to my warning. And if you should read the George M. James books, you will find out many, many other warnings as well. And that is that SIGINT is still being played in Africa. So wherever the NATO and US forces are being deployed, do not think for one moment that your radio signals are not being intercepted by your enemies. And once your radio security is broken, and it's very easy because of your lack standards, people will die. But now we are at the end of this. I've given my warning once again. Jock, I wish to thank you. I found this so fascinating. The wonderful thing about intelligence is it's a never ending story. There's so many facets of it. It's, it, it to me, it's just fascinating. So I thank you for your time. I wonder if you can tell us quickly, what are you going to talk about next week? Chris, so next week um, in episode four, I'm covering the, the period now at the end of 94. Um, we, uh, I make a career choice to change um, from um, electronic warfare and signal intelligence, but stay with me, Jerry, can now focus on uh, imagery intelligence. So uh, I'll, I'll tell you that story and also how I was sent um, to the Royal Air Force to do my imagery intelligence with them. That was absolutely fascinating and a career highlight for me. Uh, and there will be some uh, really exciting stories uh, also covered in that one. Um, and then finally, on my return to South Africa, I was um, uh, appointed as the project officer for the upgrade of JARIC, which was now the last phase of a 10-year project to get uh, JARIC now ready for uh, digital imagery and satellite imagery. And it was the downstream side of South Africa's uh, space program. Um, so we'll, we'll cover a bit of that as well um, and tell you some of the, the interesting stories and, and things I learned um, through that process as well. And that will take right through to the end of my Air Force career um, in early 1999. Well, I must tell you, I'm looking forward to that. It's probably going to be out in a, on the 22nd of December. I might be wrong, but if I am, forgive me. You need to subscribe. You need to click that, uh, that little button thing, that bell thing, and then you will know. I want to say to all of you listening here, thank you for that. Thank you for spreading the word to Forms Ops. As I always say, you were not unimportant. Everybody contributed. And I am interested in everybody's story. Please come and talk to us. All you need to do is send me an email, 
Once you've done that, I'll get back to you at some stage. We will talk about it. We'll book you far into the future because we really now um, lined up for the next few months already, but you are most welcome with us. So thanks again. Until we meet again, God bless.